We want the files on Malcolm X to be open so that the world may see the real truth of what went down. We want the truth to be made known so that we as a people can be made free of suspicion and of doubt and let the truth condemn whomever truth would condemn. But the people must go free. And we in the nation of Islam, as well as those outside of the nation of Islam, need to know all of the truth as it relates to the assassination of Brother Malcolm X. Absolutely. We need to know all of the truth, all of the facts as they relate to the assassination of Malcolm X, especially in light of the fact that it is your organization, Minister Louis Farrakhan, that is responsible for the cold-blooded murder of Malcolm X. When I say your organization, I don't mean the Nation of Islam that you rebuilt since 1977, but the organization to which you once belonged uh, under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad. When Tal Maj Haya, one of the um, three men convicted for the assassination of Malcolm X, eventually named his four co-assassins, they were all individuals attached to Temple Number no. 25 in New Jersey, and they were all rank and file members of the Nation of Islam. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you. Back in the early 1990s, when um, Spike Lee's movie Malcolm X was um, set for release, who are the victims of America? You and I, we've never seen any democracy. Um, you gave a number of uh, lectures on the assassination of Malcolm. Come on, man, talk to me. In which you purported to tell the real truth about what really happened to Malcolm X, and in which you sought to counter what you felt was um, negative and hostile propaganda by the media. Um, that sought to uh, implicate or impugn the Nation of Islam collectively for the killing of Malcolm X and to try to obviously uh, implicate you personally in the killing. ...about the long-held suspicion that Louis Farrakhan, the current leader of the Nation of Islam, had been behind the assassination. Now these are the lectures that you gave. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X, 28 years later, what really happened? These speeches together with the speech that you gave at Malcolm X College. But you were behind the scene, calling the shots. And uh, your 1987 lecture series of the final called Administration Building, How to Give Birth to a God, in the fourth and final of the um, lecture series, um, you dealt at some length with the domestic life of the uh, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In this book, the Holy Quran, which is the final revelation of God to this world before the judgment, Allah gives Muhammad permission to take nine wives. And uh, the your relationship with Malcolm X and what happened in that relationship. Having studied your speeches in great detail, to figure out the Farrakhan problem. I'm warning you, Mr. Reagan, and I'm warning the government of America. And having checked the claims that you make against the literature on Malcolm X um, that has since come out. It makes a mistake when it tries to say we're as good as you are because they're admitting that you're better. I, I personally don't endorse that. I've identified a number of problem areas in the accounts that you've given. Oh, come on! Most particularly, the account that you gave of a meeting in December following Malcolm X's silencing and your uh, temporarily replacing him to speak in his place at Temple Number no. 7, a meeting at which Malcolm X told you about the wives of the messenger. That Sunday, the 
first Sunday that Malcolm was sat down, I was the minister that was asked by Elijah Muhammad to speak in Malcolm's place. Uh, you have given an account both of when the meeting took place and what was discussed at that meeting that is contradicted by Malcolm's own account. And we need to try to get to the truth, as you stated in your introduction, as to what actually happened at that very critical meeting. Keep the revolution alive! Now, the timing that you've given of the meeting, namely that this meeting took place after Malcolm was silenced, is curious. But most importantly, your account of what actually happened at that meeting is of cardinal importance. You have claimed that following Malcolm X's um, suspension or silencing for the Kennedy comments, that you, the first Sunday after his silencing, you were assigned to Temple Number 7 to speak in his place. And that after the, um, your lecture, Malcolm took you to his home. The late Dr. Betty Shabazz, Malcolm's wife, served the two of you dinner, left the room, and with just the two of you in that room having dinner, Malcolm began to tell you about the wives of the messenger. All praise is due to Allah, to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You claim that Malcolm told you about the wives and then asked you. And he said to me, he said, brother, what do you think about this? What do you think, Brother Lewis? And you told him. I said, well, I was really stunned, shocked. I said, well, I think that there's no God but Allah. That's all I could say, and Muhammad is his messenger. There's no God but Allah, Muhammad is the messenger. And he told you, or requested of you, that you not tell anybody what he just told you and you were to reply I said no sir I'm not going to tell anybody but the messenger you will tell nobody but the messenger now this is an interesting description or account that you've given because it is contradicted by Malcolm X what is noteworthy about your account is that in your description of what Malcolm told you, you tell us that Malcolm told you about the wives and then simply followed that up with a question, what do you think, Brother Lewis? According to Malcolm X, in his autobiography, he describes uh, the meeting on page 409. Um, this is after he had already discussed with uh, Elijah Muhammad earlier that year in April 1963 in Phoenix, um, discussed the whole situation with wives and had uh, decided upon a theological or a fulfillment of prophecy defense for um, the messenger. Malcolm, uh, in other accounts, um, claims that he met with Wallace Muhammad, the son of Elijah Muhammad, and they talked about the situation with uh, Mr. Muhammad and they um, formulated or they searched the scriptures, they searched the Bible and the Quran for scriptures that could be used to explain Elijah Muhammad's domestic life to the believers if this information ever came, ever came into their knowledge. But in reality, it was, it was because I had come to New York and told Joseph captain in New York and uh, the secretary and the minister in Boston about these children that Mr. Muhammad had. And it was that, well, that right there was the real reason for my being out of the movie. Now according to Malcolm X, um, he decided as part of this effort to defend the messenger to speak to a number of um, officials and ministers in order to both confirm that yes, the rumors are true, the messenger has wives, and two, to furnish them 
with a scriptural presentation with which to defend the messenger. According to Malcolm X, page 409 of the autobiography, I decided I had better prepare six other East Coast Muslim officials whom I had selected. I told them, and then I told them why I told them, that I felt they should not be caught by surprise and shock if it became their job to teach the Muslims in their mosques the fulfillment of prophecy. So in Malcolm's account, he came to you for the purpose not just of telling you that the messenger had wives, but of furnishing you with a biblical and Quranic uh, presentation with which to defend the messenger. It was like a blinding light and I became aware that he was in the room with me. In your version of events, you appear to have omitted the scriptural fulfillment of prophecy defense that Malcolm says he brought to you. You describe yourself as having been shocked and surprised by what um, Malcolm told you. That night I couldn't sleep. When I first heard it, I could not sleep. I looked at my wife, she was fast asleep. And I was a little jealous because I wanted to sleep, but I just couldn't sleep. I mean, my mind was upset because I did not know how to handle that knowledge. And you then returned to Boston in a state of inner turmoil. You were shocked, befuddled, bamboozled. You could not believe what you had just heard. You went home and you couldn't sleep. And uh, the next morning, Malcolm rang you, woke you up, and then requested of you. My wife was sleeping in the bed. I couldn't sleep all night long. I'm turning, tossing, mine all messed up. 5 a.m. the next morning, Malcolm calls. Brother Lewis, I want you to delay writing the messenger so I can get my letter off to him explaining what I said. I said, well, brother, it's going to take me some time to get my head together to write the letter. And if you can get your letter off to him in that time frame, please do so. I said, I don't want to be caught in no struggle between two powerful men. He said, there ain't but one powerful man. I said, well, you've got that right. You then claim that in your state of alleged turmoil, you went into your study, you searched the Quran, or at least you opened the Quran, and it miraculously fell open to page or Surah 33. Luckily for me, I got up and I prayed. And I went into my little office and I took my Quran and I said in the name of Allah and I opened the Quran and it opened to the 33rd chapter of the Quran which deals with the life of Muhammad and God giving him permission to take wives. This is what you claim, that you essentially were the one who searched the scriptures for a scriptural defense for the messenger. Now, you, you claim that when you opened to Surah 33 and found the, uh, the uh, accounts of the way in which Christian missionaries had slandered the Prophet, had um, uh, accused him of being a voluptuary and whatnot, and when I started reading about the wives of the prophet and what the Christian missionaries said about him and the slander on the prophet, I said, this is it. We can defend him. I called Malcolm back. I said, Malcolm, I found something in the Holy Quran. I'd like to come over and talk to you about it. He said, come on. Now, I read Surah 33 in the light of what you claim you found in it. I've searched both the main text and the commentary and I find no reference to Christian missionaries slandering the prophet over his wives. 
I'd like you to show us where in the in Surah 33 it makes any reference to Christian missionaries slandering the Prophet. I'd like you to show us which version of the Quran, which translation contains a reference to the uh, scandalizing of the Prophet over his um, consorts or his wives. All praise is due to Allah. Hey, everybody in Harlem is a Muslim. How could you have found something in the Quran that isn't there? How could you have opened as God would direct your hand to the 33rd surah and found references to Christian missionaries that are nowhere to be found in surah 33. So that's what we'd like to know. Another thing, in every single account you've given, you claim that when Malcolm X told you about the wives of the messenger, it blew your mind. I couldn't sleep that night. I, according to Malcolm's autobiography again, Page 409 again, when Malcolm met with you, because he mentions you in the autobiography, and told you about the wives, quote, I'm going to read from the autobiography, I found then that some had already heard it. One of them, Minister Lewis X of Boston, as much as seven months before. My wife sleeps, you don't know what's going on. I can't sleep because my head is messed up. You telling me that the fountainhead of my righteousness now has fathered children from some of the sisters. I'm upset. According to Malcolm X, when he came to you to tell you about the wives of the messenger, you already knew about it. It wasn't news to you. And it isn't just Malcolm who says that. According to Benjamin Kareem, in his memoir, Remembering Malcolm, on page 153, he says this of the state of knowledge about wives. Captain Joseph knew, so did Louis Farrakhan and a number of other Nation of Islam ministers. Most of them knew even before Malcolm. We don't believe in celibacy. No. In the FBI files, um, Claiborne Carson, in an FBI report of a meeting that took place in Phoenix, Arizona on the 2nd of January 1964 between um, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, Raymond Sharif, John Ali, uh, in the FBI uh, report, there's plenty of um, redactions, as you know, um, bureau deletions. That is where a name has been scribbled out or redacted. Uh, it's replaced with the expression Bureau of Deletion. I'm going to read a um, paragraph which appears to, to uh, corroborate this claim that Lewis X already knew about it, even though your name isn't mentioned. Quote, Elijah asked Malcolm why Malcolm had been checking into Elijah's personal affairs. Malcolm stated that he had not asked anything about this, but had heard it in Chicago. Malcolm said he talked to Bureau Deletion, the redaction, about it, and he already knew it. Now, again, as I said, it doesn't mention your name, but it's quite possible that the name lurking behind that redaction is yours. Malcolm said he talked to the Bureau Deletion about it, and he already knew it. Minister Farrakhan, let's begin by talking about the record. And if it is true that you did, then in the speeches that you have given, in which you purport to tell the real truth of what happened to Malcolm X, that is the first falsehood that you've spoken. And it isn't the only one. To be in New York City, the city of my birth. There is another um, claim that you make um, about what happened at this meeting with Malcolm X. In the speech that you gave in 1987, the fourth part of the How to Give Birth to a God lecture series of the Final Call Administration Building, you claim that when Malcolm sat you down at his table to tell you about the wives of the... He said, look, I'll get the sisters on the phone and trick them into a conversation. I said, that won't be necessary, brother. I believe what you're saying is the truth. So you claim that Malcolm offered to, as it were, trick the sisters into a phone conversation that would get them to disclose this information to you. That claim is completely missing from your Malcolm X Collins speech. 
it's missing from your 1993 Part 1 um, Saviour's Day address in the UIC Pavilion, and then that claim resurfaces in your um, Mosque Mariam uh, address, the, the second part of the Saviour's Day um, lectures. And as Allah is my witness, I will never lie by the grace of God. Malcolm said, I'll get Evelyn and Lucille on the phone and trick them and make them say that Elijah Muhammad is the father of their children. I said, you don't have to do that for me. Your word is sufficient. What is curious about that claim is that these women that you would have us believe Malcolm was trying to or contriving to trick into a conversation had already gone to the media with their story. UPI, Elijah Muhammad, 67-year-old leader of the Black Muslim Movement, today faced paternity suits from two former secretaries right. who these charged are slanders, that he Betty. fathered these their are lies. Don't children. you realize that? Don't you realize whose newspaper this is? They'd already told the press. They'd already filed paternity suits against Elijah Muhammad. So the, the idea that Malcolm would have needed to trick them into a conversation when they were more than happy to tell anybody uh, who the father of their children was, is yet another claim that strikes me as a blatant falsehood, an embellishment to your account of what transpired at that meeting. You also claim, uh, you've claimed just only once, that is in the speech that you gave at Mosque Mariam, you claim that when Malcolm had asked you, don't tell anybody what, what I told you, and you said, um, you're not going to tell anybody but the, but the messenger. You claim Malcolm jumped, that he had a, a sort of a, a panic reaction uh, to um, to your uh, telling him that you were going to tell the messenger. When I said I would tell the messenger, he jumped. Again, none of this, none of this so-called jump, this involuntary convulsion that you uh, uh, that you simulate in your presentation is in your 1987 um, account at uh, the How to Give Birth to, to, to a God lecture series. It's nowhere in your account at Malcolm X College and it's nowhere in your 1993 presentation, even though in all those speeches you basically tell that same whole story all the way through. That is, you give your account of the meeting. When I said I would tell the messenger, he jumped. Yet another embellishment, you can see. How many wives did Prophet Muhammad have? He had nine. Some scholars say he had 11, but God reduced the number to nine. Mr. Farrakhan, if the taking of wives, as you put it, is permitted by the Quran, why all this cloak and dagger secrecy and hiding? Why the concealing of these wives from the believers? Le Monde, French daily newspaper, said I stood up with four veiled wives standing behind me. Well, the first thing people ever know about Islam is that those Muslims have more than one wife. Before you know anything else about Islam, indeed before I ever knew anything else about Islam, I knew that um, the, the thing that Muslims were known for having was wives. So nobody would have found it surprising um, if Elijah Muhammad had in fact taken wives. So Malcolm went by himself to Chicago and met with Imam Wadid Dean Muhammad, who was then Wallace D. Muhammad, who had just come out of prison and learned that his father had taken wives from among the secretaries. It's a complete self-contradiction for you to be the nation of Islam, for you to have this book as your foundation, Surah 33 available to every believer, and yet claim that the believers would not have understood if, you, uh, if Elijah Muhammad had disclosed the fact that he'd taken wives. Admirers are hailing the wife of slain civil rights leader Malcolm X as a tower of strength to the African-American people. The only reason the, uh, Elijah Muhammad probably kept his wives um, from uh, the knowledge of the believers was because 
it's a violation of the restrictive laws of the nation of Islam for you all to take wives. She said, help my husband. Say he's getting old now and he can't do what he used to do. Help my husband. He was afraid that he had himself fallen foul of the very rules that he enforced on others. And another thing, if the taking of wives was permitted, and if these women um, were the wives of, of, of the messenger, why were they brought before the Nation of Islam's quasi-judicial body, charged by him with adultery, and then thrown out of the Nation of Islam, or put into isolation? For the minister, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything to be put in isolation. I believed in him. Believed in the honorable Elijah Muhammad. If it was perfectly permitted for the messenger to have wives and for these women secretaries to be his wives, why were they uh, treated in the way that they were? Why would Elijah Muhammad sit in judgment and condemn as adulterers women who were bearing and carrying his children? You've often uh, used the story of Hagar running between the hills, but please, there are no parallels between the predicament of Hagar and the callous way in which Elijah Muhammad treated those women who were thrown out of the nation of Islam for adultery that he was himself guilty of. Some of you say, well, if it's the truth, it should be told. Sometimes truth is not good to be told. There are some times when you tell the truth, you will destroy something that is not ready to hear the truth. Sometimes truth is not good to be told? And how far would you carry that proposition? If it is wrong to tell people the truth because they don't have the mind to handle the truth, what gives you the right to tell white America the truth about her wrongs and her injustices against African Americans. God is plaguing you, America, and if you don't wake up, you'll die in your ignorance. God is judging America. Maybe they're not ready to hear the truth. So who is the arbiter and who decides what truth is good to be told and what isn't? Or are you in fact trying to rationalize the deceit and the lies that were told by Elijah Muhammad and those around him about Malcolm and about the reasons why Malcolm had been removed from the nation of Islam. And when Malcolm gets on Cups and Ed's show, on Jerry Williams' show in Boston, Mike Wallace talking about the private life of Elijah Muhammad, every Muslim that loved Elijah Muhammad then began to hate Malcolm. That's complete and utter bullshit. The hatred of Malcolm X predated Malcolm X ever publicly speaking on the domestic life of Elijah Muhammad. It is a falsehood. It is deliberately misleading of you, Minister Farrakhan, to suggest that it was only after Malcolm spoke against the messenger that you turned against him. Malcolm X was already hated even before he was suspended for the, for the Ch Kennedy um, comments, the chickens coming home to roost. Is your life in danger from the Muslims and Elijah Muhammad's group? Well, Elijah Muhammad uh, has given the order to his followers to see that I am crippled or killed. It is completely false to suggest that you all were reacting to Malcolm's moves. The first time that Malcolm X ever went to Mike Wallace or Irv Kupsinet or any of these other reporters to discuss the um, so-called domestic life. He never went to discuss it. Well, my purpose here is to remind the uh, African heads of the state that there are 22 million of us in America who are also of African descent, and to remind them also that we are the victims of uh, America's colonialism or American imperialism, and that our problem is not an American problem, it's a human problem. It's not a Negro problem, it's a problem of humanity. It's not a problem of civil rights, but a problem of human rights. He went to discuss his trip to Mecca, his trips to Africa, to discuss his efforts to try to internationalize the plight of African Americans. It was only under their badgering 
It was only under their questioning, it was only on their insistence that Malcolm X was compelled to tell them why he was really out of the Nation of Islam and it was only after there had already been multiple attempts to kill Malcolm X by the Nation of Islam. The ministers say you're spreading untruths about Mr. Muhammad. The ministers say that you're the greatest hypocrite, uh, uh, Judas. In fact, the first recorded attempt on the life of Malcolm X occurred during the 90-day suspension. Somebody by the name of Lukman, L-U-Q-M-A-N, was, was hired or contracted, if you will, yeah, sometime in February. This is from uh, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Kareem's uh, memoir. Sometime in February 1964, Brother Lookman, an explosive specialist, received orders from FOI Captain Joseph. Captain Joseph. I wasn't remarkable. I wasn't sorry. But what? To wire a bomb to the ignition of Malcolm's car. So while Malcolm X was still under the 90-day suspension, the first attempt by the Nation of Islam to murder him occurred. And there were multiple attempts to kill Malcolm X. And so the speaking so-called to the media on the domestic life of the messenger happened after the Nation of Islam had already tried to kill Malcolm several times. Are you not perhaps afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh yes, I probably am a dead man already. John Ali had already gone on a program called Hotline to threaten the life of Malcolm X. You, Louis Farrakhan, then Louis X, had appeared on the Jerry Williams show threatening Malcolm's life. All of this happened before Malcolm X had ever spoken on the domestic life of Elijah Muhammad to the press. So it is false of you to suggest otherwise. You give people the misleading impression that once Malcolm left the Nation of Islam, he did the talk show circuit um, talking about the domestic life of Elijah Muhammad to um, the, the press. You're a liar in suggesting that. Anyone who suggests that is a deceiver. Malcolm X, once he had announced his break from the Nation of Islam, continued to pledge loyalty and fealty to Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that the only solution for the problem is that our people, of which there are now 22 million, be uh, involved in a mass exodus back to our own homeland. In his press conferences, he continued to say, I'm a believer in and follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm still a Muslim. My religion is Islam. I ran into some obstacles in the nation of Islam and, uh, and because of those obstacles, obstacles placed in my path not by Elijah Muhammad but by others, I've decided that I can best expedite the program of Elijah Muhammad outside the nation of Islam than inside of it. In the 90 days that I've been silent, I have come to the conclusion that uh, I can best help spread the solution that the, and the diagnosis that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gives of the so-called Negro problem in this country by continuing to remain out of the nation of Islam and working on my own without restriction in the way that I think I best know how. So even after Malcolm X had left the nation, he did his best to remain loyal to Elijah Muhammad. It was people like you and others in the nation of Islam who did your best to continue to aggravate and widen the rift between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. The incitements were all one-sided. They were coming from your side. And you only need to listen to your despicable rhetoric at your Savior's Day addresses. Did you teach Malcolm? Did you make Malcolm? Did you clean up Malcolm? Did you put Malcolm out before the world? Was Malcolm your traitor or was he ours? And if we dealt with him like a nation deals with a traitor, what the hell business is it of yours? And it's quite clear that you people had already determined in your minds that Malcolm X must be killed, even though he hadn't done anything that could in any way be, um, that could in any, in any way justify the killing of him. But you were the, the aggressors. You were the ones who were bent on his ruination. And it was only after it had become crystal clear that this organization was trying to kill him that Malcolm X was compelled to tell people the real reasons why he was out of the organization. Elijah Muhammad is the leader of the black people in this country as he professes that he should be concerned with the brutal treatment that our people are receiving in the state of Mississippi and send his well-trained fruit of Islam down there to protect our people instead of sending them out here in the street to attack former Muslims who don't want to go along with this program anymore. In fact, the Nation of Islam, even by the time of the Mike Wallace interview, 
was trying to repossess his home. The same Malcolm X who had built temples for the nation of Islam across the United States, the same Malcolm X who had brought millions and millions and millions of dollars into the coffers of the nation of Islam and brought tens of thousands of followers into the ranks of the nation of Islam, this was the same man that you were trying to deprive of a $16,000 home in Elmhurst. I would like to ask Sister Tynetta Muhammad, Sister Evelyn Muhammad, Sister Ola Muhammad, Sister June Muhammad, if you would please come up. Stand up and give these sisters their due. Now, isn't that interesting? Here you are at your Savior's Day address in 1993, inviting onto the stage the very wives that back in 1964, the Nation of Islam leadership was denying to its followers even existed. These are not no cheap women. These are wise women who produce wise children. When you staged this propaganda stunt at your uh, Savior's Day address, all you did was vindicate Malcolm X. Malcolm X had in fact said that Elijah Muhammad had fathered children by his secretaries. And there were the secretaries at your Savior's Day address, 1993. Why are they threatening your life? Well, uh... Primarily because they're afraid that I will tell the real reason that they've been, that I'm out of the black Muslim movement, which I never told, except to myself. But the real, real reason is that Elijah Muhammad, the head of the movement, is the father of eight children by six different teenage girls, different, uh, six different teenage girls who were his private personal secretary. The person that you ended up vindicating was Malcolm, and the person you ended up condemning as liars was the nation of Islam because in 1964 it was your position that Malcolm X was lying, that there was no such thing as wives of the messenger, and that Malcolm was some hypocrite. And in 1993 you proved that it was yourselves that were the hypocrites. But brother Malcolm, his teacher loved him, extraordinarily so. And to protect Malcolm, silence him. Don't let him go in the public and speak. Because if he goes in the public, maybe he would have been assassinated because of the love that people had for John Kennedy. To save Malcolm's life? What a load of balderdash. If in fact Elijah Muhammad silenced Malcolm to save Malcolm's life, why wasn't Malcolm assigned an additional Fruit of Islam bodyguard detail to protect him if in fact Elijah Muhammad was concerned for his safety. What do I say about this national day of mourning, so-called national day of mourning? I say the white man's acts of violence should be condemned, not only by our beliefs, but by his own. The nation of Islam would have liked nothing better than to have Malcolm X killed by an angered or enraged or embittered um, person who had been offended by Malcolm's uh, comments about Kennedy. So this nonsense that we were trying to protect Malcolm X from being assassinated, you really take your audience for fools. In March, before the 90 days of his suspension was up, Malcolm went before the world and said he is leaving the nation of Islam. You just made a patently false claim that somehow Malcolm left the nation before the period of his 90-day suspension was over. That's rubbish. Malcolm X's silencing was effective December the 4th, 1963. He announced his departure from uh, the nation of Islam March the 8th, 1964. Mr. Farrakhan, if you can count at least half as well as you play the violin, that's in excess of 90 days. In March of 1997, during an appearance on Meet the Press, you had this to say. But if in a dialogue you can show me where I am in error, I am not a proud man, I will humble myself and go before the world 
and apologize. But now the burden is, will you show me where I am wrong? It's time for you to make your word your bond. You must go before the world in which you spoke these falsehoods and say you're sorry and beg forgiveness. He went to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad prior to his announcing that he would leave and he questioned Elijah Muhammad about whether this was true that he had fathered these children and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't deny it, he said yes. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told him, Hey brother, I am fulfilling what is written of me in the scriptures. Um, Malcolm X had already confirmed, with, if you've read his autobiography, he'd already confirmed with Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad had me fly to Phoenix to see him in April of 1963. And it was at that meeting that Elijah Muhammad confirmed uh, that he had taken wives, as you call it. So the idea that Malcolm belatedly waited until February, March 64, before he was about to leave, and that was when he asked Elijah Muhammad whether it was true, is such crap. I mean, you know, if you're going to present a tissue of lies to the public, Mr. Farrakhan, you ought to do your research. You ought to make sure that if you're going to lie to the public, it at least accords with some of the truth. And at least one American, Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, agrees that the U.S., not Saddam Hussein, is to blame for the suffering of the Iraqi people. And frankly, it ain't none of your business. What have you got to say about it? Did you teach Malcolm? Did you make Malcolm? Did you clean up Malcolm? Did you put Malcolm out before the world? Just listen to yourself. To think that you, a so-called religious leader, could vituperate against Malcolm X in that despicable fashion, and to the best of my knowledge, you have never apologized for the vicious words that you spoke in that horrific, monstrous, disgusting speech that you gave in 1993. Never apologized for them. And yet you call upon everybody else to atone and to reconcile. And yet a speech like this, which is still in circulation in the world, not a word of apology from you about the viciousness that you spoke against Malcolm X. Or black person, no Jewish child. You have never seen Farrakhan say one thing about harming Jewish people or white people or any people. Now, uh, during the course of your speech, Mr. Farrakhan, you leveled a defamatory charge at the late Dr. Betty Shabazz. A vicious and despicable lie. Take a listen to yourself. But the hurting thing is, two innocent men went to prison for 25 years of their life. And they were sentenced to a prison term that they didn't deserve by the mouth of Betty Shabazz. Betty was so hurt at the death of her husband. Being in the marsh, she knew Thomas Johnson and Norman Butler, and she placed them at the scene of the crime when they were not there. According to you, Dr. Betty Shabazz is responsible for the wrongful imprisonment of uh, Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson, according to you. Now, according to The Death and Life of Malcolm X by Peter Goldman and um, uh, Michael Friedley's Malcolm X, The Assassination, and the accounts of the 1966 assassin, uh, assassination trial that they both contain, according to both books and according to the transcripts of the trial, when um, the late Dr. Betty Shabazz took the witness stand to testify um, about what had transpired on the 21st of February of 65 in the Audubon Ballroom, she wasn't able to identify 
any of the gunmen who killed her husband. She wasn't able to identify Tom Archhair. She wasn't able to identify um, Norman Butler. She wasn't able to identify Thomas Johnson. This is in the transcripts of the trial. And the judge in the case, uh, uh, the presiding judge, Charles Marx, said as much himself that Betty did not identify anyone. That Dr. Betty Shabazz did not identify anyone. She did not point to anyone. So your assertion that Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson were sentenced to prison terms they didn't deserve from her mouth was a defamation of Dr. Betty Shabazz. In October of 1998, you appeared on Meet the Press and had this to say. But I don't think that I should have to apologize unless I am shown that there is something that I said that is untrue that is not correct, then I would have no problem whatsoever of going before the world where I made my mistake and correct my mistake and ask for forgiveness. Apologize for telling a blatant lie against Dr. Betty Shabazz. She was not responsible for the wrongful imprisonment of Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson. The Nation of Islam was. Because the Nation of Islam knew from day one the identities of the individuals that Tal Marchaya later named as his co-assassins. The Nation of Islam has known all along who murdered Malcolm. You withheld that information from the authorities. As such, you, the Nation of Islam, bear full responsibility for the wrongful imprisonment of Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson. In that scenario, was Malcolm worthy to sit in the seat of Elijah Muhammad and lead? and be a redeemer of our people? Wait, wait, wait. The presentations that you have given on Malcolm X are lies from start to finish. And in the context of those lies, naturally Malcolm X comes out unfavorably. Naturally Malcolm X doesn't look as, uh, as impressive as you imagine you do. Malcolm X was a man of the ultimate character. And when on the 21st of February 1965, his gunmen assembled in front of him to execute him. <laughs> Malcolm didn't beg for forgiveness. Malcolm didn't plead for his life. He didn't say, please don't kill me. Malcolm said, cool it, brothers, and they murdered him. Even in that split second, Malcolm X displayed a gallantry that you can only dream of. And been cast into the fiery furnace, a land where they've been making it hot as hell for us for 400 years. There's a statement, uh, Mr. Farrakhan, that you have um, that you've attributed to Malcolm X. Um, a statement you claim he made to you in the last ever meeting you had with him. The last conversation I ever held with Malcolm. We were sitting in his Blue Oldsmobile, the same one that's now in Malcolm X College in Chicago. And Malcolm said to me, as God is my witness, he said, Brother Lewis, he said, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. Now, with all due respect, Mr. Farrakhan, did Malcolm X ever actually say any such thing? Did any such a silly statement ever actually come out of Malcolm's mouth? Or is that not yet another one of your inventions and blatant fabrications? The last conversation I had with Malcolm X, he was about to leave the nation. And in that same car, out there, we sat in front of his home in Long Island. And Malcolm looked at me and said these words. He said, brother, I wish that it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example 
for you. The, the idea that he could have intuited that his situation was being an example for you is rubbish. Every single time you are accused of complicity in the murder of Malcolm X, you always deny the accusation by emphasizing what a junior position you held in the Nation of Islam. In fact, in your interview, your, 19, your 1985 interview with the National Alliance, you have um, stressed the fact that you didn't have any standing, if you will, within the Nation of Islam to be in any position to have played the role in Malcolm's assassination that you are accused of having played. Um, I have never been investigated for any part or complicity in the assassination of Malcolm X. I've never been mentioned in the early writings on Malcolm's assassination. My name never came up because I was not a major player in the nation of Islam. Oh, I, I don't know Willie Hart and I'm Louis Farrakhan. So when you attribute to Malcolm X a statement in which Malcolm appears to somehow predict your future, when you were a person of little or no standing at the time, that right there places a cloud of doubt over the uh, credibility of that particular statement. That Malcolm X would say to you, his understudy, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. I can't even see how Malcolm could come out with a statement like that. A, a statement that seems so selfish and self-pitying and so at variance with everything that we know about Malcolm's character. You make my point. <laughs> I mean, what you're basically trying to get us to believe is that Malcolm X was essentially wishing his misfortune on you so that he could benefit from it. You want us to believe that Malcolm X said to you, I wish you had, as it were, fucked up for my benefit rather than the reverse. You're not an American. You're an African who happens to be an American. Malcolm X was a man who assumed responsibility for his actions. He would never come out with a statement that pathetic. Not a man of Malcolm's caliber. And so I'm convinced that the I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you is another one of your fabrications. And it's a fabrication designed to fit this theme that you, you've, you've concocted for your Malcolm X story. So Malcolm died in reality that I might live. I thank Allah for his life and I grieve over his death. In other words, you've conceptualized your relationship with Malcolm in those terms, that Malcolm's life, his alleged mistakes and his death were somehow preparatory for your own career. So naturally, in the context of that particular conception you have of the relationship between Malcolm's life and your own, Malcolm would have to have said something like, Lewis, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. It's, it's not only a blatant fabrication, but it comes across like that. It, it sounds like a, a, a made-up statement. I wish it was you being an example for me rather. It's, it's too mechanistic. It's got a Lego-like, put-together, cobbled-together quality. I could be wrong, but I'm probably right. And he named all the enemies that I would have that were his enemies, and he didn't lie, he knew. Malcolm knew my future before I knew it. And he knew that I would be the one. Oh! that would replace him. He knew that his life and his death would be an example for me. And if it were not for that example, I'd be dead right now. Likewise, um, your claims that Malcolm X somehow told you about who your enemies were going to be in the nation of Islam is such blatant. When did you become the national spokesman? When did you assume Malcolm's role? In 1967. When did Malcolm X have this alleged conversation with you? In 19, late 63 or early 64. And yet you want us to believe that Malcolm X predicted who your enemies were going to be once you assumed a role 
that was still four years into the future? I mean, it's only in your capacity as national spokesman that you began to be the focus of this alleged enmity and envy. The idea that Malcolm could have seen that far ahead to tell you who your enemies were going to be is a blatant lie. God has made me a better man for you than Malcolm X. I'm standing where Malcolm would have stood if he had the character to stand where I'm standing. God has made you a better man for us than Malcolm X? Are you completely crazy? In what way? Name a single respect, Mr. Farrakhan, in which you represent an improvement on Malcolm. Name one thing. Name one thing you've done that you, you can in all honesty say would have been beyond Malcolm's ability. With a vicious cycle of poverty, of ignorance, of apathy, of disease, and of death. And they have these old Uncle Tom Negro leaders coming to Harlem, telling you and me that times are getting better. Your times will never get better until you get them better. Name a single talent of which you are possessed that in all candor you can say would have been beyond Malcolm's reach. There may be one ability you have that maybe Malcolm might have struggled competing with you on. That's it. Nothing else. There is no other respect in which Louis Farrakhan is better than Malcolm X. No way! Malcolm X is your superior by tens of thousands of orders of magnitude. You are nothing compared to Malcolm X. You are fit to untie his shoelaces. I'm telling you, they came out of those cars and we have enough witnesses to hang them. With their guns smoking. Chief Parker knows this, Mayor Yardy knows this, and every police official in the city knows that. They didn't fire no warning shots in the air. They fired warning shots point blank at innocent, unarmed, defenseless Negroes. When Malcolm X uh, left the Nation of Islam, he made his pilgrimage to Mecca. He then embarked on a tour of the African continent and the Middle East and Europe, internationalizing the plight of African Americans and circulating a document of the Organization of African Unity that got African diplomats to condemn United States human rights abuses uh, against African Americans um, in the UN. Malcolm X had a direct impact on the discourse in the halls of the UN General Assembly and Security Council. Louis Farrakhan has been around longer than Malcolm X. Louis Farrakhan, after decades, managed to eventually embark on a world tour where you traveled to more countries than Malcolm, you met more heads of state than Malcolm, and yet you've done less with it. Here's on the itinerary of Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, who leaves tomorrow on a world tour of 52 countries. U.S. officials have warned an Iraq visit would be illegal, but Farrakhan says he doesn't think there's anything wrong with a Muslim visiting a Muslim country. If Malcolm X were to return today, not a single person would be paying any attention to anything you have to say. And you know that. If Malcolm were here today, there'd be no reason for a Lewis Farrakhan. There'd be, because there'd be nothing that you would be doing that Malcolm X wouldn't be doing 10,000 times more effectively, 10,000 times more eloquently, 10,000 times more universally. I am bigger now than Malcolm ever was when Malcolm was alive. He did not have the following that I have. He did not have the influence. Malcolm got influence in death that I got in life. I want you to listen good now. What a retarded comparison. Malcolm did not have the following you had. You're speaking to more people today than Malcolm X. That's just, that's an idiotic comparison. You have been around longer than Malcolm X. 
you've had more time to cultivate a following than Malcolm X. Naturally, you're speaking to more people volume-wise than Malcolm. The important thing is, are you saying anything more substantive than Malcolm? No. Malcolm today, we can remember every word he said in a speech. Get any of your followers if they can remember anything Farrakhan even said at the Million Man March. That was your biggest in terms of most publicized speech. Is there anybody who can remember a single sentence from Louis Farrakhan's speech besides when you add a one to a nine you get a womb that is pregnant? What? Garbage! Go Trouble ahead. came from this house. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tear it up. Martin Luther King's trouble came from this house. Malcolm's trouble came from this house. There's nothing that you are that constitutes an advance in Malcolm X. And so being bigger in terms of a greater volume of a following means nothing, as I'm sure you would agree, to the substance of what you are. Our mother has made a transition. I'd like to think of it as that. Her living life was very strong, and her fight here showed that endurance. Occasionally, Minister Farrakhan, you do say um, some true things about Malcolm X, um, particularly in this um, litany of Malcolm X's virtues that um, surfaces in a number of your speeches. Malcolm was the most disciplined brother that I had met. He dealt with that one meal. And I never saw Malcolm eat between meals. Never. I never heard him curse till the end of the time that he was among us. I never saw Malcolm chew gum, eat a piece of candy in between meals. I never saw Malcolm wink at a, at a sister or try to play with women. I, I never saw this. Malcolm was like a clock. Whenever he had an appointment, I would watch him. He would drive up just about a minute before the time. And he'd be walking in 15 seconds before the time. And when he sat down at the table in the restaurant meeting, whoever he was to meet, it was right on the money, on the money. He was disciplined, he was punctual, he was courageous, he was intelligent, he was a tactical man, a man who tactically planned moves to advance the cause of black people. I adored Malcolm. I want you to listen to me good. Malcolm was so clean that when they opened him up on the operating table to take the bullets out of him, the doctor said he had never seen a body so clean in all of his life. You bear witness to the moral purity of Malcolm X. You never saw him wink at a woman. You never saw him indicate any kind of moral laxity. Can the same be said of Mr. Mohammed? Can the same be said of Minister Farrakhan? I, I read one passingly about a man named Shakespeare. I only read about him passingly. But I remember one thing he wrote that kind of moved me. Uh, he put it in the mouth of Hamlet, I think it was, who said, to be or not to be. He was in doubt about them. <laughs> Whether it was nobler in the mind of man to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, moderation, or to take up arms against the sea of trouble than by opposing end it. And I go for that. If you take up arms, you'll end it. But if you sit around and wait for the one who's, who's in power to make up his mind that he should end it, you'll be waiting a long time. And in my opinion, the young generation of whites, blacks, browns, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, 
and now there has to be a change and a better world has to be built and the only way it's going to be built with it with it, it is with extreme methods and i for one will join in with anyone don't care what color you are as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth thank you There's a story, uh, Mr. Farrakhan, that um, surfaces in a number of your um, in a number of your speeches, where you make a claim that I find pretty extraordinary. You claim that when you were still in your mother's womb, that she tried to kill you. I I said something last Wednesday night about my own personal circumstance that my mother early in her pregnancy wanted to get rid of me and that thought is a heavy thought in a woman's mind when she's trying to get rid of a child you've, you've, you've made that claim in a number of other speeches and every time you make it I'm always troubled by it. That is, I'm troubled by the gratuitous way you you kind of use it as a way of illustrating the, the the manner in which your psychology and your motivations have been formed. Now, in in this, uh, I think it's a 1997 uh, biography. 1997 biography by Florence Hamlish Levinson, uh, looking for Farrakhan. It's got a nice picture of you on the front, where you look a little like Darth Vader, a black Darth Vader. Um, she also describes this story of your mother supposedly trying to kill you. Says Levinson. So she tried, he says, you say, three times, quote, to kill me when I was a child, her baby in her womb. She just couldn't bear the shame. Now, this is Levinson. This is a perplexing story with a hollow ring to it. It sounds as if Farrakhan might be inventing this story as a strangely poignant one to use against one of his favorite targets abortion and birth control. She goes on to say, we're being asked to believe that Farrakhan's mother told him this story about her abortion attempts and her reasons. Whatever the story says about his mother, what it says about Farrakhan's attitude towards his mother is much more significant. I mean, it is a it is an interesting story. I I won't go there because I I hope it's a, a, a I hope you it's I, I I I'm going to have to assume it's a true story because I can't quite frankly fathom anyone who would make up such a story about their parent. I'm a beautiful human being. And I'm not talking about this. I mean, that's nice too, but it's what's on the inside here. Mr. Farrakhan, I want you to take a look at um, an account. This is again from your How to Give Birth to a God lecture. This is the way in which you tell the story of Uriah. Uriah being a lieutenant of King David in the Bible. Take a listen to the way you tell the story. Uriah was one of David's soldiers. He loved David immensely. But David went out one night and he spied this beautiful woman in her tent. And this beautiful woman, David, desired her. Well, that's a married woman. 
Oh, I shouldn't desire her. That's the law. Now a battle comes up and David sends Uriah into the battle. Uriah gets killed. David now has access to Uriah's wife, whom he saw in the tent and desired. Now you may say, isn't that horrible? This is pretty shocking, what you've done with the story of Uriah. You have mutilated and completely distorted the story out of all recognition to what the story actually is in the Bible. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. In 1998, you gave an interview in which you recounted something that Elijah Muhammad told you about yourself. He shook my hand and he whispered in my ear, you remind me of David. And when he said, you remind me of David, he was telling me, in essence, probably that I reminded him of himself. And at that very moment, he knew where my future was. In other words, the two of you, Farrakhan, Elijah, see yourselves as the antitypes or the fulfillers of King David. You see King David as your biblical archetype and you see yourself in some way as his antitype or the person fulfilling what his story in a sense foretold. He has brought me back from the dead to lead my people. After me there will be no more. No more. Because of that conception you have of yourself as a latter-day King David, you automatically run into the problem of Uriah, a righteous man serving in the army of David, whose wife David lusted after, Bathsheba, made pregnant, and then David contrived to kill Uriah or have Uriah killed in order that he could take Uriah's wife. This is the way the Bible in chapter 11, this is the second book of Samuel, chapter 11, uh, verse 15. And he wrote in the letter, this is David writing, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him. We, pull back from him, that he may be smitten and die. That uh, I should have been killed, that my tongue should have been put in an envelope and sent back to Chicago by now. And God cursed David for the cold-blooded killing of Uriah. God said this, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou, this is talking about David now. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword and children of Ammon. Now therefore, this is God now punishing Uriah, therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, thou David hast despised me, God. Now that's you now, since you're David since thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee, you, out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. I would hope that Israeli authorities would give me permission 
to enter. Now, the reason, Mr. Farrakhan, that you distorted the story of Uriah is because Uriah is clearly the biblical archetype of Malcolm X. You know it, Elijah Muhammad knew it, Jabril Muhammad knows it, everybody knows it. Malcolm X was the antitype or fulfiller of Uriah, a good man who was murdered in order to cover up an act of adultery by his superior. Not that Malcolm was married to the wives or any of them of Elijah Muhammad, but nevertheless Malcolm's death came about as a result of a similar circumstance and a similar motivation on the part of King David slash Elijah Muhammad slash Louis Farrakhan. A mighty God is going to destroy America. The way you tell it, you strip David of responsibility for Uriah's death. You don't tell it like it's contained in the Bible. You twist the story in order to avoid the implications for your own self-concept as a latter-day David. You gotta put a lot of stress on it. And if it cracks under the weight, then you know that's not the board you were looking for. You throw it away and get you another one. Now, this is serious. If Louis Farrakhan is willing to distort the scripture in the way he tells it to his believers, to his, uh, to his flock, what other scriptures have you distorted? What other accounts have you given of alleged biblical and Quranic scripture that are completely mutilated out of recognition from what they really were in the Bible or in the Quran. How many other passages of scripture that contain what you believe to be aspects of your own life or the or uh, uh, archetypes of your own self? What other aspects of the scripture have you distorted to get around the implications for the way you conceptualize yourself? And if you would tell the story of uh, Uriah in the dishonest way that you did, what other, I mean, you certainly wouldn't hesitate to tell the story of Malcolm in the dishonest way that you've done. It's little wonder, if you could uh, reverse the story of Uriah and say, David spied Bathsheba, a battle came up, Uriah died, and now David had access to the wife, when in reality the reverse was the case. David had already accessed Uriah's wife. He'd already made her pregnant. And once, once he discovered that this was the wife of, that Uriah was a husband, had Uriah killed. So if you can distort the scripture in the way that you do, you have committed a sin of a pretty serious order of magnitude because it's dangerous to play with God or to play with his word and to deceive and mislead people in the name of God. That's a dangerous thing to do. And we therefore cannot trust anything you say on the subject of Malcolm X. If you're a man unhesitating in perverting the word of God, you wouldn't hesitate to pervert the word of man. Hence, your claim that Malcolm said, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. That's a fabrication. That's a statement that you have made up. Your claim that Malcolm X said, let's get the sisters on the phone to try to trick them into a conversation. That's another one of your lies. Indeed, your whole story of Malcolm X is a lie. And so you, Mr. Farrakhan, have a lot to answer for. Not to me, but to the God you claim to serve. That God has been watching you. I mean, if I can see and catch you in the lies that you tell with the, with the internet, what the hell do you think God can see? If you can't hide from me, how the hell can you hide from God? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Here you are in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, peddling more of your moronic conspiracy theories um, about who was behind the killing of Malcolm X. Malcolm X! Elijah Muhammad, according to the Freedom of Information Act and the papers that we have received, 
The government worked night and day to separate Malcolm X from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And once they had that accomplished through their agents on both sides, they fermented the thing. And then Malcolm was murdered by black people. But when the truth does come out, because it hasn't come out yet, two innocent Muslims spent 26 years of their lives in prison, lost their families for a murder that they did not commit. But the one brother that was involved in the murder named those who were involved in it with him but the government would not reopen the case because the government wants it to remain that the nation of Islam killed Malcolm X so that their bloody hands can be wiped of the murder no, they didn't pull the trigger, but they inspired it. I've always been intrigued by your, your mothership, the so-called wheel. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris. <laughs> left alive. You describe it in a way that on the face of it sounds nonsensical. You say that the wheel, a wheel, is a human built planet. The wheel is a human built planet. Now, Take a look at the planet Saturn. The planet Saturn is a sphere, like a normal planet, but it's got a ring or a wheel that goes around it. How can the wheel be a planet? How can the sphere of Saturn be the wheel that goes around it? The mothership is always described as a wheel, cyclical in configuration. But you say it's a human-built planet, which would be spherical. So how can a wheel be a sphere? That's like saying the giraffe is a rhinoceros. Here on this table are all of the speeches that I have made on Malcolm X. They are available for you to look into my mind and my heart and every word that I have uttered in public about the man that you say I was his rival. I was never a rival of Malcolm X. Malcolm was my teacher and my mentor and I never considered myself his rival. This is what you have made. You never considered yourself to be Malcolm's rival and you challenged your audience to study your speeches, to look into your heart and mind to see whether they could find any evidence of this rivalry? And what do we find when we actually take you up on that challenge? God has made me a better man for you than Malcolm X. I'm standing where Malcolm would have stood if he had the character to stand where I'm standing. We find that very rivalry that you were denying expressed in its most virulent and stark and grotesque terms possible. So when you make this equally forceful assertion... So let's open the files up. Let us all see, lying demons, they know that Farrakhan had nothing to do with the murder of Brother Malcolm X. We have no choice but to assume that the truth lies in the opposite direction.
talking about his uh, visit with Elijah Muhammad. He went into a small spaceship and then into a larger spaceship. And the mother wheel. Elijah. Yes, and uh, Elijah Muhammad told him he had a vision of uh, Ronald Reagan you know, invading Libya and so on. You never miss an opportunity to engage in a little revisionism of history as you did at the Khalid Muhammad um, press conference where you tried to draw a false parallel between um, your rebuke of Khalid Muhammad for his King College speech and Malcolm's silencing over the Kennedy comments. 30 years ago, yes, yes. around this very season, yes, right. the most popular minister of the nation of Islam, Malcolm X, made a statement from which the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had to disassociate himself and the nation of Islam. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad rebuked Malcolm publicly and Malcolm chose to leave the nation and attempted to discredit his teacher. Now what was interesting about this press conference is that the audience which had been cheering you on throughout, the, um, throughout your presentation the minute you tried to drop that lie on them that Malcolm left the nation and attempted to discredit his teacher, the, the, the applause disappeared. Because no matter what you try, whatever effort you put forth to try to revise the history of what happened to Malcolm and what you did to Malcolm, it always falls flat, as it did in this pathetic and clumsy attempt that you made on the Donahue show. I like to say just as it is improved to say that white people killed Martin Luther King, it is also improved to say that the Nation of Islam killed Malcolm X. Right. Yeah. See? Uh, there, but there, but there you go beyond white that, people. you said white people killed Malcolm. I didn't say that. I said the government of the United States had a hand in the assassination of Malcolm X. We know it was black folk that pulled the trick. We know that. Right. So, thank you for such a wonderful... There you are, again, trying to exonerate the nation of Islam for the killing of Malcolm, and you probably thought that the audience was going to erupt in applause for you. The papers of Malcolm X, this is Newsnight from New York. <laughs> On occasion, uh, the Nation of Islam tiptoes towards some kind of recognition of the evil you did to Malcolm, and then you pull back, as you did during this uh, excerpt from your Million Man March speech. Brother Malcolm had that same road to travel. He pointed out what was wrong in the society. Right. Right. And he had to suffer for pointing out what was wrong. And he ultimately died on the altar for pointing out what was wrong inside the nation, outside the nation, to the greater nation, and to the smaller nation. We're talking about moving toward a perfect union. Would you care to spell out what wrong Malcolm pointed out inside the nation? Tell us, Mr. Farrakhan, what was the wrong that Malcolm pointed out inside the nation? Try to be honest for once in your life. Now, what kind of mold? Wait a minute. Now, this account that you give is um, pretty interesting. Uh, you describe um, an effort that you undertook in the 1970s to um, raise money to make a movie about the life of Malcolm X. Brother Akbar was with me. We were in Uganda with Idi Amin. Idi Amin called Muammar Gaddafi and told Gaddafi, I got a brother here that you have to meet. And they flew me from Egypt to Uganda and from Uganda back to Libya on Idi Amin's plane. And we missed Gaddafi. And so he had me meet with his people. And when I told his people what I had in mind about a movie, did they mock me and kind of laugh and I had to kind of beat them up a little bit? Nothing happened. One of the, uh, your hosts on this tour was Idi Amin. 
General Idi Amin Dada, the former dictator of Uganda and one of the worst mass murderers in African history. And yet listen to the way you talk, sort of wistfully recalling your times with Idi Amin, wistfully remembering jet setting about the continent on his plane. Idi Amin had a year earlier, a year prior to your trip, assuming your trip was in 1977, a year earlier, Idi Amin had hosted a plane loaded with Israelis who were being held hostage by uh, PFLP Palestinian terrorists and the Bader Meinhof gang. They'd landed at Entebbe airport and were being essentially ho hosted um, by Amin uh, at the Entebbe International Airport. And this whole terrorist enterprise was brought to an end when the Israelis sent a uh, special forces commando team headed up by the older brother Benjamin Netanyahu uh, to conduct Operation Thunderbolt, which rescued the hostages. But that affair, the, the raid on Entebbe, Operation Thunderbolt hostage crisis, had made Amin notorious throughout the world as a sponsor of international terrorism. Holy oh my shit! God. Holy shit! And yet there you were, a year after that, in his company, trying to raise money to make a movie about the life of Malcolm X. And you said that uh, you were unsuccessful in securing funds from the Libyans and the Saudis and I can only thank God that you were because if you, Mr. Farrakhan, were planning to distort the life of Malcolm X on the big screen the way you've lied about Malcolm in your speeches I can only thank Allah, God, Jehovah that you were never given a penny to make the film Cowardly Negro! Spineless people! And so, Mr. Farrakhan, in my conclusion, in the light of the falsehoods and inaccuracies that I've just catalogued in your presentations on Malcolm X, it's about time you considered the following. When James Muhammad the managing editor of The Final Call, in August of 2003, allowed into print a story that contained an insinuation that the Reverend Jesse Jackson had something to do with the murder of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. James Muhammad submitted his resignation to you and had to step down not through anything he had done as such. He hadn't made the allegation, but he had been, as it were, negligent in allowing it into print without proper uh, review. When Dr. Khalid Muhammad gave a speech at King College, you rebuked him and you removed him from his post as national spokesman. And you gave your reasons. I found the speech after listening to it in context, vile in manner, repugnant, malicious, mean-spirited, and spoken in mockery of individuals and people, which is against the spirit of Islam. While I stand by the truths that he spoke, I must condemn in the strongest terms the manner in which those truths were represented. You, to your mind, uh, found nothing untruthful in what he'd said, but you disliked his manner. You stood by his truths, condemned his manner. What would make you think I would make some special place in my heart? He had to step down. In your case, in the speech that you gave in 1993, you made a defamatory false statement against Dr. Bari Shabazz from your own mouth. 
James Muhammad did not lie on Jesse Jackson, but he had to resign. Khalid Muhammad, to your mind, did not tell untruth, he just told the truth in, a, in an objectionable manner. But in your case, we have example after example after example of you making false statements from your uh, podium at Mosque Mariam and elsewhere, distorting the scriptures, the story of Uriah. If James Muhammad had to resign, if Khalid Muhammad had to step down, what should Louis Farrakhan do? Not only should you now make good on what you told Tim Russett on Meet the Press in August of 2000. If I have done evil, Mr. Russett, I've said it here, I'll say it one more time. How then can I atone if you don't sit with me in a dialogue and show me where I am in error? If you show me where I am in error, I will come before the world and apologize. You must go before the world, you must apologize, you must confess, and then you must resign as leader of the nation of Islam. You are no longer fit to hold that office when you have dismissed your subordinates for less. Now any of you that know organization, I don't care how great you are, there has to be discipline in any organization in order for that organization to be effective. And the greater you are, the more you should be disciplined because if you start straying away and there's nothing to bring you in line, pretty soon everybody will start messing up. You have demonstrated that it isn't Malcolm who lacked the character to sit in the seat of Elijah Muhammad, it is you. You have soiled the seat of Elijah Muhammad and you must now resign and turn over the leadership of the Nation of Islam to the National Council of Laborers or whatever your governing body is and they should appoint a successor to Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan has brought the office of leader of the Nation of Islam into disrepute by virtue of the lies that he has told and he must now resign.